how have we ended up in this position, right? Because the academy really was the great bastion of free speech. It was the it was the place for, uh, you know, a good idea would drown out a bad idea. So how right. have we ended up here? Well, I mean, if you look at the long history of academia back when it was also a religious institution, I mean, there were many in much of the history of academia has been about defense of orthodoxy. And some have argued were academia swinging back to that historic uh, you know, pre 19th century role of being a defender of orthodoxy and dogma, uh, particularly because of these new sort of progressive values that are increasingly defining the missions of universities. Um, so that is an ideological project. It, it, it really begins in earnest in the, in the 1960s. Um, if you read Nathan Glazer, for example, some of the critics of the student revolts in the 1960s who said, you know, Glazer started out on the left. He was involved in the support of the Berkeley free speech movement in 1963, 64. But then he says what happened is what, turned, what started out as a movement to defend the right of people to protest the Vietnam War and to criticize um, suddenly switched and became quite authoritarian. And the movement actually started saying, well, we don't want to have army recruiters come on campus and businesses come on campus and we want, we're going to occupy the dean's office and strike and we're going to not allow professors to speak. And it became much more about that kind of mob control of speech rather than defense of free speech. So I would say wired into the DNA of the cultural left, particularly the post 1960s, uh, left is an authoritarian streak. And that's become more and more apparent as their power has grown, as they become a larger share of prof professors, uh, a larger share of administrators, controlling more and more positions, calling the shots, that authoritarianism has come more and more to the surface. So I don't think this is new. This is not a post-2015 development. It's It was already there. And you can already see episodes of canceling happen in, happening in the 70s, in the 60s. They're just more frequent recently. So it's a frequency issue which has been powered by social media and online clickbait news sites, but it's not actually a new ideology. I would say the biggest problem is a skew, a huge skew to the left. The ratio of Democrats to Republicans amongst American professors is, depending on which subject you're looking at, somewhere between 14 to 1 to 17 to 1 to, you know, in anthropology, you can't figure it out because there are no conservatives. <laughs> so I think that that is a much more pronounced skew than was that was true in the in the 70s or 80s. People say, oh, there's always been political correctness. That, that misses the point. What has happened is that the academy has become a place in which progressive, not just liberal, but progressive thought is dominant. And it's intolerant in the sense that there is no tolerance of, of a dissenting view. That means that unlike in the 1980s, when I was an undergraduate, right-leaning academics and students feel very inhibited about, about speaking out. And so there's less free speech on university campuses now than in, in, in pubs. That can't be a healthy thing. When I was starting out in academic life, part of the appeal of it was here were places where you could think the unthinkable and say the unsayable if you could back it up with, with evidence. These were places where you had arguments at the highest level and it was no hold bars intellectual combat. If you had the data, if you had the evidence, uh, you could win the argument, even if your position was... Uh, in some ways, uh, a kind of unpalatable one. one. One of the things that drew me to the United States was that it seemed to me that US economists were particularly willing to uh, engage in intellectual combat in this way, and that this was producing really terrific work. We've lost that in a relatively short space of time. In other words, in, in the space of less than 20 years we've entered this era of wokeism in which if you step out of line and say something that causes any minority group to take offense 
you risk being cancelled. You, you risk losing the, your job. At the very least, you'll suffer reputational damage. And that means that the majority of people um, who are rather uh, timorous, since cowardice is a very powerful force in history, say to themselves, well, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be out there like Brett Weinstein being flayed alive by his own university. And I, I don't want to be Eric Kaufman on the receiving end of an absolutely disgusting Twitter attack by some group of woke students misrepresenting uh, things that he has said and done and, and trying to present him as some kind of racist. It's absolutely abhorrent to me that this kind of thing is done because in fact, Eric Kaufman does excellent work, including a really, really good report that, that was published just a few months ago on precisely this problem that we're talking about. In fact, almost the best study of the, the problem of uh, academia today in the UK and the US and in Canada, where he's actually from originally. And so for making that kind of argument, for arguing that we have a problem of free speech, people feel uh, that they have to self-censor, he becomes the target for just the kind of social media hit that is designed to intimidate people into silence. I thought that tw Twitter thread was disgusting. And I, I think the people who, uh, who published it should be thoroughly ashamed of themselves. Those are the people who are the enemies of free speech and free inquiry. And it's their behavior that is making academia such an intolerable place, an intolerant place. And if, if the Birkbeck authorities pay any heed at all uh, to the attack on Kaufman, they will be doing themselves as well as him, a great, great disservice. Unfortunately, all too often in these cases, the attacks are taken uh, seriously by university administrators, uh, even when they come from uh, a, a small number of, of politically motivated individuals. And all too often, uh, the administrations engage in uh, highly questionable inquiries and investigations, which usually are entirely without due process that then put uh, the academic in question into a kind of uh, a best naughty corner and, and, at, and at worst into some kind of uh, disciplinary process. So this better not happen at, at Birkbeck. If it does, uh, I will certainly join, I'm sure a great many people who will speak out uh, strongly against, uh, against it and in favor of, of, uh, of Kaufman. Why do you think that people like yourself, like, uh, Brett Weinstein, like uh, Steven Pinker, like Neil Thin, have kind of become these uh, targets. What, are there any common denominators there? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a clash between the sort of pursuit of scientific reason and pursuing the facts where they lead and mm. social justice activism, which, I mean, it's a, it's a clash of priorities, what Jonathan Haidt would call the uh, the truth-seeking university versus the social justice university. And essentially, we have a group of people who want to elevate the social justice stuff to the top of the pyramid. And whenever the truth-seeking stuff in some way clashes with the social justice stuff, then the truth-seeking stuff has to be thrown under the bus. I mean, that is really their worldview. So they are kind of counter-enlightenment. And in a way, you can see that in the radical studies fields where uh, there's a lot of criticism of science as Western Eurocentric, um, and really, it's, it's there's a lot of time given to uh, what's called standpoint epistemology, the idea that you know, as a speaking as a, an indigenous person, as a trans person, uh, you know, yeah. this is my lived experience. So the idea of lived experience as knowledge, or or, or you know, this term indigenous knowledge is sometimes used for. Uh, the sort of traditional knowledge of, of indigenous communities, that that somehow has a, an equal standing or even a higher standing than, um, you know, evidence-based, um, representative sample-based science. You know, this, this, this is kind of a new orthodoxy that's challenging, if you like, the old uh, side, basis of science. And it's very regressive. So the, the term regressive left, I think, is, is suitably applied to that group. Um, so yeah, they're they're really seeking to overturn in a way the values of the traditional university. It's interesting that earlier you um, mentioned Neil Thin because he was uh, I think it was this morning actually I was I was reading about that and um, so 
Neil Thin is from the University of Edinburgh and the students here, they accused him of uh, racism and sexism. And um, his views apparently were described as prog problematic, triggering, offensive, bigoted, racist, misogynistic, and <laughs> transphobic. Usual, all the usual. Yeah, all the usual. <laughs> you know, and I guess from the sounds of that, the students of the you know University of Edinburgh, they must be kind of very confused as to how uh, Goebbels is teaching their social anthropology class. Right. <laughs> but again, you know, he's none of those things. So what did you make of, uh, of that case? Well, I, I mean, I think it's, <clears throat> there's a number of interesting facets. I mean, one, it's a classic, the classic playbook of what's called concept creep, expanding the meaning of terms mm. so that, you know, criticizing, renaming David Hume Tower becomes akin to calling somebody the N-word, you know, the, essentially the collapse of, the, of any nuance. Uh, if you can tar some action or behavior with this term racism or misogyny, you can shut it down. So it's a, it's a weaponization through inflation. What George Orwell talked about, the meaning of words becomes political rather than scientific. And that's kind of what's going on, I think, uh, with these students. What's interesting with the Thin case, a couple of things. One is that he's actually now pushing the university, he's saying he won't teach until they actually, you know, get these students to sit down, not punish them, but get, he wants a meeting so that he can actually clarify what's, uh, you know, what these accusations were and, and have some sort of pushback. Because you're right, I mean, in a way, as, um, one University of Texas professor who's anonymous was writing, he said, in a way, the process is the punishment. These people can go on slinging accusations. It's like the ones that were directed at me. Next year, next week, they could do the same thing, and there are no consequences whatsoever for what they do. Right. Uh, right. The university is not going to touch them, right? So they can sling, they can try again and again and again, and they may all fail, but they can put people through the ringer, tie them up. And in a way, what they're doing is chilling speech because people will say, I don't want the hassle. I'm just not going to say this. Uh, and so they managed to, to achieve their aim, which is to shut down free speech. What role do you think the academia plays in bad ideas originating? Oh, well, it's uh, academia, as we find it, is a tremendously corrupt place for lots of reasons, many of them quite mundane, like the way we fund universities tends to put a bias in the sciences in favor of experiments and against theory, which is preposterous because science functions when theory correctly predicts the results of experiments. But because universities are fueled by what's called grant overhead, which is the top 50% of uh, any grant that is awarded, um, there is a tendency inside the university to hire people who run expensive experiments that need big grants. They very easily dispense with theorists who need access to a library and pencils in the ideal case um, because they don't bring in big grants. However, what this does is it short circuits the scientific process and creates a, an iterated series of observations that are not scientific. And so ideas that should be quickly dispensed with by the partnership between theory and experiment may live on, they may even come to dominate fields. And that means that academics are, without their knowledge, peddling low quality material because they've, uh, they've compromised the goose that lays the golden eggs. If you were given free reign on academia, what else would you change about the current system and setup? You, well, first of all, the population of people that inhabit the academy has shown tremendous cowardice in light of the absurd notions that are fueling the modern protest movement. And so I would say we have a basic problem, which is that the culture of academia is timid and compliant in the face of power. It has tolerated really low quality ideas like postmodernism, uh, critical race theory, um, queer theory, and that in some sense, it's hard to imagine the system being corrected without a turnover in uh, who is in the faculty. And that turnover would have to be accompanied by some sort of a plan to get more courageous, deeper thinkers into those chairs 
in a way that they were safe enough to to stick around. So I must say I'm kind of um, not optimistic about the prospects of academia in the next generation or two because it is so broken. We have allowed the problem to get so so bad that it will be very difficult um, to rescue the institutions. There, I should also say though, we should rescue them. For one thing, they have all these beautiful campuses that have everything you need to run a really good educational institution. So it would be the perfect place to do it if you decided to be serious about education and research. Young people may be coming out of high school and um, maybe they're in that uh, place where they're out, out of high school before university, wondering what approach to take, wondering if university is the only approach to take because I think for a lot of people here in the UK especially, there's almost a script written where if you don't go to university, then you're considered instantly less than everyone else who did. How do you maybe give advice um, to those who maybe are looking elsewhere or they don't know where else to turn? Um, this is a very tough question because I don't think there really is good advice. Young people are caught in a bind, which is that even if a university education is close to useless at this point, um, one may still need the credential in order to be taken seriously. So um, it's hard to know how to advise them. I think it's a, a huge waste and frankly, it's become a racket. The uh, tremendous price of a college education is not mirrored by the value of what you'll learn, but it continues to flourish because uh, the mythology suggests that it is necessary for high quality thought. Um, were that not the case, I would advise people to make use of all of the resources that are now everywhere that allow them to teach themselves how to do things of very high value. Um, so I think you can uh, get a, quite a high quality education if you have the correct motivational structure by sourcing the insight that you need um, outside of the official structure, but it won't give you a degree. What would you say to the person listening now that's, uh, that is thinking, yeah, I see the case for campuses. I see the blue head, you know, angry people running around taking control the of the campuses. The blue head. The, you know, what's the, that? Just students with blue hair. Oh, blue hair's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the blue head. Uh, illiberal students running around taking control of their campuses but they say okay it, this is just for campus this isn't happening oh. in the real world what well, do you say to that, just, that, that i've always said this that's just kidding yourself um the idea and and you know to be fair um uh well actually i don't know if i want to be fair um, I could understand how in a previous generation you could try to make the claim that students who go to Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard or Princeton or Stanford, um, you know, they're just on an island off by themselves and who really cares. Um, but in society today, these are some of the most powerful and intellectual, uh, 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 powerful institutions in the world. Um, and that we defer to them. On research, it's very good that we defer to a lot of these institutions, well, depending on the topic, but, you know, on hard sciences research, you know, you can't really beat Caltech or MIT, for example. Um, but when it comes to, uh, when, it, when it comes to other topics, you know, particularly the more politicized they are, the more, um, uh, the more you have to be, you have to wonder, it's like, is, is a group that doesn't have a single dissenting voice really going to be uh, a, a, objective on this? But we have deferred way too much influence in terms of hiring for the most prestigious jobs, particularly in the United States, to these um, very small, fancy schools um, that, uh, <laughs> that's, that's showing my, my, my anti-classism coming out, you know, the fancy ones, um, <laughs> going go to, go to the, these, these um, elite colleges. And that they get, going to elite college is one of the ways that you can kind of guarantee for your kids that they're going to stay in the, uh, what, what, what Americans love to call the upper middle class, but really we should be calling the upper economic class because, you know, it just goes up into the stratosphere in the United States, how, how many times uh, more you make if, you, if you're at that level. Um, and if you have these institutions creating people who have these ideologies, of course, they're going to bring it to work with them. And, and we, we've seen this over the summer, you know, with, um, uh, with people at newspapers stepping down. Um, I mean, we saw this 
in in just a matter of a couple months, um, James Bennett, the head of uh, the New York Times, stepped down. Barry uh, Weiss. Uh, uh, Barry Weiss, uh, who, who's a friend, and and both uh, and Barry very much citing kind of like this new ideology, mentioning coddling of the American mind in the process of, uh, yeah. process of it, um, and this kind of like uh, click of uh, of elite students who also at the New York Times had older people who you know kind of agreed with them or just wanted to look cool to them, um, which is an unfortunate dynamic that I've seen. Uh, but this happened at camp uh, all over the country, and then you had Glenn Greenwald, you know, step down for the Intercept that he co-founded, citing precisely this. You had uh, Matty Iglesias step down from Box, and he more hinted at this, but he definitely talked about si situations that were like this. Andrew Sullivan. Is basically like you know to to a degree he's like the father of blogging like he, he he's one of, he at one point was one of the more influential voices in the country he got kicked off of New York Mag which is like kind of you know second middle tier um, and these are institutions that we rely on to make our to, to, to figure out the world the way it is and so there's there, there's a guy that I, I argue with I, I like him a lot but he basically is like no 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 what's the big deal what, this one you know so what. A dozen people got fired, you know, maybe two dozen. And it's like, well, that we know of, you know, it was bad enough that 150 people wrote Harper's to say, like, listen, we have an environment that is very conformist. It, it, it's not pluralistic. It, it, it's actually very, um, it's actually very intolerant. And when you, when you look at it from the point of view of how many people were making some of these issues one of their main things, you know, Andrew Sullivan's right at the top of the list. He was writing about this all the time, and that's essentially what got rid of him. Uh, Glenn Greenwald was pissing off his, um, uh, sorry, uh, I don't know if it's a family show, uh, his, <laughs> his, his, his staff for being an old school free speech guy. Um, that's really important when there's only a handful of dissenters and all of them lose their jobs. Um, uh, you have to wonder about what that says to people who aren't, you know, as famous as J.K. Rowling, for example, or that many of the people assign the Harper's list. So this is this is going into the quote unquote real world and it's having it's wreaking havoc. And people are come to me in height a lot and they say, listen, you can't I can't name the corporation, um, but we have this new generation of students and they are used to every conflict being intermediated uh, by uh, either a parent or an adult or some official in K through 12 or in higher education. And that means that every small interaction that's negative ends up going to human resources and human resources has become probably too powerful um, in, in the United States and um, and in fear of lawsuits that 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 gives these uh, for what would have been considered sort of junior members disproportionate power and and they know how to they know how to use power um, in that way because you get you get schooled in that in K through 12 and, and in higher education. So I, I think that we're seeing well, with some of these cancellations and, and with um, some of the backlash, um, we're seeing some of the uh, the downside of having um, uh, students sort of indoctrinated in these ideas about themselves um, hit, hitting the real world and it's going to get worse. What would be an example of, as you say, a parasitic idea? Sure. So the, the, the granddaddy of them all would probably be postmodernism because in a sense, it is the perfect uh, virus of intellectual terrorism or nihilism because it basically posits that there are no objective truths. Everything is constrained by subjectivity, by the personal biases of whomever is doing the exploration. Now, the problem is that scientists do wake up every day thinking that there are universal truth to be discovered. Now, something that is true 300 years ago, scientifically might be updated and no longer be true. So we, so in science, we talk about provisional truths. So when we say truth, we don't mean that it is revealed truth as would be the case in science, in uh, religion. But we do wake up every day thinking, well, there is a universal human nature that we might want to study as evolutionary psychologists. Well, postmodernism completely shatters that idea. And so I compare postmodernists to the 9-11 uh, guys. So the 9-11 folks, because they were zealots of their ideology, flew planes onto buildings. Well, postmodernists fly planes of bullshit onto our edifices of reason and slowly destroy everything that has made, you know, the scientific method and, 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 and you know, other such epistemological approaches completely irrelevant because, hey, it's all subjective. I'll, I'll give you maybe a quick story. Uh, some of your viewers might not be familiar with it, others may, but it's still worth hearing if they know it. In 2002, uh, one of my doctoral students had just defended his dissertation and 
we had gone out for a ce celebratory dinner, myself, my wife, him, and his, his date for the evening, somebody that he was dating. And he had warned me ahead of time that that particular individual, the date in question, was a graduate student in cultural anthropology, postmodernism, and feminism. So sort of a holy, holy trinity of bullshit. The dark triad. <laughs> the dark triad. And so he was sort of telling me, hey, let's, let's not get too heavy. Let's have fun. I said, oh, you got it. Mom's the word. I'm going to be on my best behavior, which of course was nonsense. I wasn't going to be on my best behavior. And so about halfway through the dinner, I very gingerly, very politely said, oh, you know, I hear that you are a postmodernist. Do you mind if, so there are no universal truths, correct? Yes, none. Okay, well, do you mind if I propose what I think are universal truths and then you can tell me how you would think otherwise? She was, yes, absolutely, go for it. Uh, okay, well, within your homo sapiens, only women bear children. Is that not a human universal? Is that not true? Can we not take that to the bank? Absolutely not. What a stupid thing to say. Oh, really? How's that? Well, there is a tr Japanese tribe off some island where within their mythological narrative, within their folklore, it is the men who bear children. So by you restricting it to the biological realm, that's how you keep us barefoot and pregnant. Once I recovered from my mini stroke, I then said to her, okay, uh, how about uh, we take a less contentious example, one that's not as laden with you know, animus as saying that only women bear children. She goes, go for it. Well, is it true that from the vantage point of anywhere on earth, Sailors have relied since time immemorial that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, to which she, there she used what's called deconstructionism. She said, well, what do you mean by east and west? Those are just labels. And what do you mean by sun, that which you call the sun, I call dancing hyena, to which I answered, well, the dancing hyena rises in the east and sets in the west. And then she said, well, I don't play these label games. So the reason why I always repeat the story, because she wasn't an anomaly. She wasn't an outlier. She was just aping what, you know, 30, 40 years of this kind of bullshit training, training has caused people to do, which is reject that there is something called the sun, reject that women bear children and so on. So it's not a good epistemological trajectory to take. So that would be the top idea pathogen. If you have time and you want to discuss others, I'd be happy to. Sad Sad says that the granddaddy of all pathogenic ideas is postmodernism. And I think he said on this show that when you start to negate the scientific truth, that that's a, a one-way ticket to living in a toxic, toxic world. Do you agree? Oh, well, I absolutely agree. I've discussed this with, with Gad many times. He's a great explainer of, of this. I mean, in essence, the idea that because white men have made discoveries of the past, that something is either inherently wrong or that science is somehow systemically racist hmm. or that math or physics or anything else, these, these things, these are the great unifiers. Math is the great unifier of the universe. The idea that you, if you discover a scientific discovery or, or you can unfurl a mathematic equation and suddenly your lived experience is, meaning I'm a, I'm a, transsexual black latina lesbian or something that that supersedes the the uh the the problem that you've solved the equation that you've solved the discovery that you've made that that's actually crazy and that is at the essence of postmodernism uh, that your lived experience somehow is more important than what is empirically true and you know look the simple way to look at this is these, these immutable characteristics things that they're trying to make us really care about. The truth is we all know it's not right. And how do you know? Well, if you right now had a heart attack, would you care what the color of the skin or the gender or sexuality was of the doctor? Of course you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't. You would want the best doctor. If the doctor ran in, you're having a heart attack right now, right? Time is limited. You're in chest pain. You can't breathe, blah, blah. And the doctor walked in, though the doctor was you looked, and the doctor's a white heterosexual male. Would you ever say, no, no, I'm sorry. I, I would prefer that we had uh, a black trans woman here. Of course you wouldn't. Would you want your plane to be flown by the most qualified pilot, regardless of those characteristics or because of those characteristics? I think we all know the answer to that. But again, we pretend that these are fights that we're supposed to be having for some very bizarre reason. Mm. I see, don't burn this book behind you on the shelf there. Um, I see that as a, a bit of a call to individuals to avoid factory set in thinking and to become independent thinkers. What are some of the tools that we need to start thinking independently? 
I mean, in, in many ways, that really is sort of what the essence of the book is about. I mean, the, when I say factory settings, what I'm talking about is that most of us, without even realizing it, the, the factory settings that you're sort of born, up, born with, at least from an American perspective, but I think in many ways at a UK perspective as well, is that it's sort of lefty stuff. It's kind of, from our perspective, it's like, oh, Democrats good, Republicans bad, liberals care about poor people, Republicans care about money, conservatives care about war and you know and lefties want peace like these really simple things that aren't quite right but you sort of feel that from movies and music and culture and education you come up with what in essence builds into this factory setting idea and and it's your job to break through that i i think the way you break through it is you start consuming some new podcasts you start getting your information from some other places and don't just don't just trust something just because it's new i mean you, you got to check it yourself but it's on you now and and while that's daunting in a certain way, um, you know, it, that's absolutely daunting in a certain way. At the same time, that's pretty empowering, knowing that oh, you know, back in the day, how, how old are you? Twenty four. You're twenty four. So uh, I was twenty four in two thousand. So uh, so I'm t I'm forty four now. So we got a, We got a cool twenty years between us. Well, when I was twenty four. I didn't have the opportunity, this is before YouTube really, mm. I didn't have the opportunity to find information in all these different places. Find, oh, you know, go, oh, there's an author I like, maybe I can somehow talk to him and he's in another country. Like the, the power that you have as a 24 year old, I, I always try to tell that to, to college students. Cause like, man, you're 18, the way you can view the world, the information you can get and the fact that you can share that with people all over the world, that is so freaking cool and empowering and everything else, but it's on you to use it properly. You put out a tweet a couple of days ago, which I was very fond of. And you said, what is the world's most expensive streaming service? <laughs> College. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I love this one. So I'd love to, to sort of put it there. So we recently had uh, Brett Weinstein on the show and oh, he, de and right. he described um, university college these days as a, as a racket. So I would love to sort of get your thoughts on um, the university system, um, the sort of syllabus, the sort of way it's taught. Um, and then even perhaps, you know, I mean, Jonathan Haidt wrote a great book on this of sort of these sort of political issues within a university. So it's sort of a big question, but I'd love to sort of know your thoughts on just the sort of university system as a whole in, in today's age. Yeah, uh, I'd say racket is too strong a word. It's certainly... Uh, it's not a racket like like a pyramid scheme or you know something like this. Uh, more like bureaucratic fiefdoms where different departments compete for uh, budgetary dollars, and you know they all try to uh, emphasize the value of their department. They all want to hire more people, more professors in their department, or get more administrative um, staff support and so forth. That's but that's true in any company, any government agency, everybody acts like that. So that's not a racket. That's kind of business as usual. I think the, the, the problem has been this um, increase in tuition relative to other goods and services. So if you have a basket of goods, you know, a of milk, a gallon of gas, a loaf of bread, so forth, uh, and, and you just track their price increases over say 50 years, uh, and adjusting for inflation and so forth, you you see that they all go up a little bit, but you know college tuition goes way way up, and so there's debates about why this is, but w part of it is that um, the the ratio of professors to students hasn't changed all that much. What has changed is the ratio of administrators to professors or administrators to students, and that's gone way up, and that's expensive. I mean the most the the biggest chunk of any organization's budget is payroll. So the more people you hire to do whatever, uh, that's expensive, not just, the, you know, whatever you're paying them, but also their health care, retirement uh, programs and, and uh, withholding taxes and so forth. That's, that's a lot. So I think um, that plus the, the kind of plushiness of colleges and universities now with, you know, gyms and climbing walls and, and uh, you know, these really, really nice uh, buildings that these students hang out at. Uh, you know, this is, it, it's not Spartan like it used to be when I was in college in the 70s. 
uh, they're like country clubs now, you know, like a club med, like a, you know, like the gyms are, you know, spectacular. I mean, these gyms are, are like the best private gym I've ever seen. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I think that costs money. So, and then you also have the competition uh, because since the second world war, you know, the percentage of Americans going to college has been going up and up and up. Well, that's kind of finally plateaued now that the baby boomers babies are you know at, through college and you know the the the, the demographics are going to shift and there's going to be fewer students entering college in the next couple of decades consistently so that's going to drive the the you know competition up uh for among colleges for students to keep up that momentum of of uh, demand if you were sort of given the keys to the kingdom and you could make some <laughs> sort of wide scale uh, educational reform to the university system. What would be some sort of changes that you would make as a as a whole? Yeah, I I, I would say um, you know smaller classes with more interactions with professors. Obviously, that's easy at a small liberal arts college where I teach at Chapman University, but uh, you know harder to do at a UCLA with thirty thousand students or whatever. That would require hiring more professors and instructors, graduate students, and so on, to do that more one-on-one -on -one or, you know, one-on-20 small group uh, discussions that really can't be replaced by uh, online education, you know, that kind of in the, in the classroom conversations. And here I'm not even talking about lab classes for sciences or something like that. I just mean, you know, kind of a liberal arts education of learning how to think uh, you know, I just hire more of those people, hire less diversity administrators and deans, whatever it is they do, walk around campus looking for trouble, uh, you know, where we can, you know, the most liberal, tolerant, you know, institutions on the planet, you know, have hired these people to go around and look for discrimination. I mean, come on, uh, you know, how much is there really? What, what, what are you doing? I mean, wouldn't the students be better served by hiring more educational, you know, experts in different fields? Um, I also would emphasize more uh, teaching critical thinking. Now, everybody says that's what they've been doing for decades, but I mean, really thinking like a scientist. That's why I labeled my course Skepticism 101, how to think like a scientist. Here, I, I don't mean uh, the rules of logic and, 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 and rationality and all that, which is good, uh, but I mean just how to think. How do scientists think? You know, how does that consensus thing work anyway? And, uh, you know, how do we arrive at truth? What is truth anyway? And yes, that you could take an epistemology course, but, uh, but I, I think a, a more pragmatic approach to dealing with questions that are, you know, on the table now, like climate change and vaccines, uh, you know, evolution, uh, GMOs, nuclear power. You know, how should we think about these things in terms of what's really true about them and then policy? uh recommendations based on what we think is true about them and, and even that that's not just well you you have your politics i have mine and, and we can't find agreement on what's the right path to go yes we can i think we can and there's you know a way to think about that scientifically that i think i would have uh, have more classes like that 